put a medicine in its little eyes and it was blinded for life. The name of that child was Fanny Crosby. She wrote this song, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. I particularly like that last verse there where she says, Perfect submission, all is at rest. I and my Savior am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting. Blind all of her lifetime, but yet she had a great faith in her heart. Assurance in God, so that she could say, watching and waiting. The faith of Fanny Crosby was watching for the coming of Jesus Christ. Amen. Though she never could see and distinguish colors or see the blue of the heavens, nor the stars by night, nor the moon, nor the sun rising in the morning and setting in the afternoons, she never could see the trees, the color of it, the flowers, the beauty of them. She could see more than the average Christian could right. see Amen. today. She could see that her Savior was alive <clears throat> and real. Amen. And she had that blessed assurance of salvation. I wonder this morning, do we have that blessed assurance of salvation? You know, a terrible disaster happened to the folk there in California. <coughs> an earthquake. Lives lost. Hundreds of lives lost. Now I imagine some of them, they, uh, in particular, saw on television where they were interviewing one of the rescue workers, and he said, he said as he reached the automobile, says the radios would be on, and uh, even though the occupants of the automobiles were squashed or crushed to death, and he said that uh, some of the stations would be on rock and roll, some of the stations on the radio would be on contemporary music or Christian music or preaching or but anyway he says there that was taking place but he says they're falling upon deaf ears ears that could not hear and I wonder a lot of times <coughs> if the messages we stand and preach week after week service after service is falling upon deaf ears Ears that do not hear the Word of God. And I begin to think about assurance. If there's anything in this world I want more than anything else, it's assurance. Assurance like Fanny Crosby had of her salvation. I want to know that. We buried one of our church members here this past week. And there's no doubt in my mind, if God lets us remain and tarry, we'll probably bury others of our church members right here at Carolina Baptist Church. Wouldn't it be a blessing to leave this building this morning with that blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. You never know when a bridge is going to collapse. You never know when death's going to knock at your heart's door and take you out of this life into the eternity that God had prepared for us? Wouldn't it be good to have that assurance when we leave this building that no matter what happens, bless God, when we depart, we're going to be with Jesus. Amen. We're going to be with our Lord. We're going into His presence. I want to talk to your hearts this morning for just a little while or talk to your souls this morning for just a little while on blessed assurance. I find in the Word of God that assurance is the spiritual birthright of every born-again person that's here this morning. I mean, that's our spiritual birthright, is assurance. And if we don't have assurance this morning, you and I that are saved by the grace of God, if we don't have that assurance that when we depart this life, we're going out to be with the Lord, we need to come to an old-fashioned altar and get down upon our knees and get things right with God this morning. Yes. We need that. It is our privilege, it's our duty to experience and enjoy such an inner possession as assurance. Do you have it? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. 
I'm not going to ask you to stand up and give a testimony to the fact that you do have it. But I want you to just examine yourself right now. Examine your own heart. If I should die, would I go and be with Jesus? If I should die, would I go and be with Jesus? Now Webster defines assurance as meaning a pledge or a guarantee the state of being sure and certain. He says insure against risk and security and confidence. Do you have that security and do you have that confidence this morning that if you should die, you're going to be with Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Assurance occurs six times in the Word of God. And the biblical meaning of assurance is full confidence, expressing the guarantee the believer has that he is eternally secure in the Lord Jesus Christ. Dr. C.I. Schofield states it this way, Assurance is the believer's full confidence that through the work of Christ alone, received by faith, he is in possession of a salvation in which he will eternally be kept. And this assurance rests only upon the Scripture promise to him that believe. It's only through the Word of God that we have this assurance. Through God's Word. God cannot lie. His Word cannot lie. So if God says He saves our nine souls, He means exactly what He said. In the book of Isaiah, if you have your Bible, if you'll turn right there right quick to chapter 32 of the book of Isaiah, I want to show you a verse of Scripture in verse 17 of that chapter that I feel could be a blessing to your heart. Isaiah says, the work of righteousness. Of course, you know what the work of righteousness is. The work of righteousness is God giving His Son to a lost and dying world. The work of righteousness is summed up in a one verse of Scripture found in the Word of God in John 3.16. The work of righteousness is God's love to sinful men. To you and I that deserve hell, to you and I that deserve the judgment of God. The work of righteousness is God's love for us, keeping us out of hell. And he says there, the work of righteousness, watch what it shall be. It shall be peace. Yes. <laughs> Glory to God. The work of righteousness, the work of God's salvation <laughs> in a sinner's life, the Bible says, is peace. Peace. That is laying down at night, pillowing your head, and not worrying about where you're going to spend eternity if you don't wake up in the morning. That's peace. Only God can give that kind of peace. And then he says, not only a peace, but he says, and the effect of righteousness is quietness. Not running to and fro, all disturbed and uh, trouble about whether or not we're going to make it to heaven, whether or not we know we're saved, whether or not we're going to make it through, whether or not we're holding out, holding on, whether or not we're praying through, but it's knowing in Him through the works of righteousness that we're saved and have the peace of God and the quietness of soul. And now watch this. He says, an assurance forever. Glory to God. God says to you and I that have believed upon the name of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, that we've got assurance forever. Assurance forever of what? Of being saved. Born into the family of God. Saved by the work of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, many of us like this assurance. Many of God's children like this assurance. You know, there was a great man by the name of Martin Luther. A great man. 
He was a Roman Catholic. He come out of Catholicism because he read the Bible and he read in the Word of God where it's by faith. Yes. Not by doing. Not by works. But it's by faith that we have salvation. That we are born into the family of God. Well, I don't go along with everything that Martin Luther wrote. He wrote many wonderful things that are a blessing to our heart. But Martin Luther once wrote, he says, if a man or a woman or a boy or a girl that makes a profession of knowing the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior has weak faith, they're not saved. They're not born into the family of God. In other words, what he was stating to you and I, beloved, is this. We've got to have perfect assurance and full assurance that we are saved or we're not saved. Well, I believe there are those that have weak faith. And I believe they're just as saved as those that have strong faith. I believe that with all of my heart. So I disagree with what he said. And that's my prerogative. I, I have that right. That's my privilege to disagree with him. It's your privilege to disagree with him or to agree with him. But I disagree with him. There are those that have weak faith. I remember reading about uh, Spurgeon. Spurgeon says when God first saved him and he uh, entered into the ministry, he was diligently studying the Word of God. And Spurgeon said that he wanted faith. And he got down upon his knees and he would pray to God, God, I want you to give me faith. God, I want you to give me faith. And he said faith never did come. And he'd stay on his knees. God, give me faith. And says, finally one day God spoke to him through a small, still voice. And God says, if you'll read my word, you'll get faith. And Spurgeon says, he opened up the word of God and started reading the word of God. And God began to give him faith and his faith began to grow. And uh, the first thing you know, he had perfect assurance. <laughs> the reason some of us don't have assurance today, it's because we don't have enough faith. We don't hear the Word of God enough. Faith come up by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. How shall they hear except they hear a preacher? How shall he preach except he be sent of God? <coughs> when we begin to study the Word of God and our faith begins to grow, then you're going to get blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. Amen. There are those that have weak faith. <coughs> And because of their weak faith, it doesn't mean that they're not saved. Six times in the Word of God, the word feel is used. Six times in the Word of God. In the New Testament, the word feel is used. I believe one reason that many have weak faith today is because they're uh, depending upon what they feel. Well, I went to church today and didn't feel a thing. I've done that on the church and, and, and left church and, and didn't feel the same. But it didn't mean I wasn't saved. It didn't mean I didn't have assurance of salvation. I'm afraid that too many of us are depending upon feelings. Well, I won't go to church and just don't feel like it. Sure you stay at home. Well, I won't read my Bible because I don't feel I'll get nothing out of it. You won't. Well, I won't pray because I don't feel that I'm going to get answered. <laughs> and therefore, we have weak faith and not full assurance that we're saved by the grace of God. Yeah. Two times in the Word of God, the word feeling is used. Let me back up a moment. Six times the word feel is used in the New Testament and it is in no wise related to our salvation. No wise related to our salvation. Two times in the New Testament the word feeling is used. The first time it is used in the book of Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 19. And let's turn there for just a few moments. I'll let you out. Honest to goodness. I've had some folks say, boy, that old long-winded preacher, I'm going to try to let you out in 12 I really am. But let's just do a little Bible study here this morning. 
Look in the book of Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 19. And let me show you something here uh, concerning this word feeling. Well, I just, uh, I'm going by my feeling. I don't go by my feelings. We're not supposed to go by our feelings. But let me show you something here. Two times the word feeling is used in the Word of God. Verse 19 of chapter 4 of the book of Ephesians. Who be in past feeling. Now you underscore that. I believe there are those that are past feeling. But I don't believe they've ever had a regeneration experience with the Lord. I don't believe they know what it is to be standing in the sight of God in the free pardon of sin. I believe those that are past feeling are those that have heard the Word of God and rejected the Word of God and turned their back upon it and gone out into the world living, as the Bible says, in the sinishness, the lust and the desires of the flesh being fulfilled. Amen. I believe there are those past feeling. I believe you could preach your heart out, preacher. I believe you could witness your heart out, Christian. To them, I believe you could show them Scripture after Scripture after Scripture. And because they are past feeling, you could never awaken anything that's in their soul. I believe God's given them up. That's dangerous. That's dangerous when you get to the place that you feel absolutely nothing. You're coming to the place where God says, all right, this fellow has uh, failed to repent of their sin and because of the hardness and the deceitfulness of their heart, God says, I give them over to the working of the flesh. And they never feel a thing. I believe after we say no and no and no and no and no and no and refuse and make light of the Holy Spirit's work of God in our heart and in our life when He convicts us, when He touches us, when He uh, primes us to receive Christ as Lord and Savior, and we say, no! I believe God says, all right, I'll give them over and let them be past feet. What a terrible state for a sinner to be. Where you can no longer feel the convicting power of the Holy Spirit of God. Where you no longer feel that sin is sin and ungodliness is ungodliness and morality is immorality and lust is a sin. You can no longer feel that. What a state for a man to be in. I don't want to be found there, do you? <coughs> Who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanliness with greediness. Christ rejectors, hardened sinners, giving themselves over wholly to sin. God says they're past feeling. Then that word feeling is used in Hebrews 4.15. This is good. This blesses my heart. Of the second time it's used, the second and only time in the Word of God it's used. He says Hebrews 4.15, look it up. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmity. Oh, glory to God. I'm glad we've got a high priest yonder in heaven Amen. that can be touched Amen. with the feelings of our weaknesses. He who was tempted in all points as we're tempted, yet the Bible says without sin, he who hath the power to sympathize with you and I as we're making this pilgrimage journey here, he feels, he has a feeling for us. And he feels with us. Amen. That a blessing, Brother Frank. But it doesn't have nothing to do with our salvation. This week. Not one thing does it do. Has to do with our salvation. You see, our salvation is not based upon how we, how, we, uh, how we feel, how good we feel, or how bad we feel. But our salvation is based upon what we believe. <coughs> Amen? Now, our salvation is not guesswork, our hope so, but a no-so salvation as taught in the Word of God over in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 13. John says, These things have I written unto you that ye believe on the name of the Son of God that ye may know, underscore that, 
that ye may know that's assurance. I mean, that's head knowledge and heart knowledge. That ye may know that ye have eternal life and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Christ alone is the source of our salvation. There can be no assurance unless there is the acceptance of the direct testimony of the Word of God in our heart. And once that is implanted, embedded in our heart, in our soul, then bless God, let the worlds get on fire and let the heavens fall apart and let the earth crumble as an earthquake. Bless God, we've got that blessed assurance. Yeah, Jesus is mine. I'm going to be with Him one day in glory. Assurance is a mental and spiritual certainty of sins forgiven, of justification before God, of the possession of eternal life. Go to Second Peter or Second Timothy, right quick if you have your Bible. Second Timothy, and look in chapter three or chapter one, in verse twelve. In verse twelve, Paul says here, "For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know." whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Well, what was it Paul gave? Was it his bank account? Was it his morality? Was it his education? No, it was his soul he deposited with the Lord. And he says, I've got that blessed assurance God's going to keep it until that day. You see, assurance is a birthright. We must preserve it and never, never forfeit that assurance that we can have. Look in the Bible, Hebrews 3. If you have your Bible, he says that we are to hold this fast unto the end. Look at chapter uh, 3 and verse 6. He said, but Christ as a son over his own house, Whose house are we if we hold fast the confidence of the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end? In other words, he says from day one of our salvation, we're to hold fast our assurance that we are saved by the grace of God. We ought to be like Job. Job lost it all. Job had everything taken away from him. But he held fast unto the end with confidence in his soul that his Redeemer liveth. And in the latter days would stand upon the earth. He knew that. Brother, that's assurance. Amen? Amen. That's assurance. You know what assurance is? Assurance is simply this. Assurance is, you, listen, you can have everything in this world taken away from you and you can say, if somebody come and repossess your automobile, and you can say, I'll get another tomorrow, and go get another tomorrow. Someone can I come and take your home away from you, and you say, well, I'll get another, and go get another tomorrow. <coughs> you can lose everything upon your back, just like Job did. And in this life, you say, I can go get clothing again, shoes again, I can get all of these materialistic things again. But listen, there's one thing you'll never get again after you die and leave this world. And that's salvation. Yes, sir. And the truth Never be taken away from you. That's why we ought to hold it fast unto the end. I told, I told you a year from the pulpit, when God saved my soul, I saw some of these old timers been walking with the Lord 25 and 30 years, and I asked myself the question, Lord, do you think maybe I could ever do that? Lord, do you think maybe I could ever stay saved that long? Well, I did. I have. But you know it wasn't me. It was God that was doing the holding out and the holding up. It was God that did that. Hey, if I had to depend upon myself to stay saved, well, I'd be lost in a minute. So would you. So would you. You had to depend upon yourself. It, it's too much work. Hey, that's hard work trying to stay saved. 
I feel sorry for these people that don't have the assurance of salvation and are always working to try to be saved. Hey, that's too much work. It's too hard. I never attend church, I'm saved. I never give a dime to church, I'm saved. If I never witness again, I'm saved. I'm on my way to heaven, I've got that assurance. You all have that assurance. But we attend church, we witness, we give to the church, we support the work because we are saved. Yes. Amen. And because we want to be. Assurance is a wonderful thing. We ought to hold it fast unto the end. And then also in 6.14 of the book of Hebrews, he says there in verse 14, these are good, saying, Surely blessings will I bless thee in uh, chapter 6. Wait a minute. Uh, verse 14 of chapter 3. About to go too far over there. Verse 14 of chapter 3. He says, For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. That word steadfast means without waiting. Have you ever heard people say, Oh, I think I'm saved. Uh, I hope I'm saved. Maybe I'm saved. Bless God, He said, Hold it steadfast. Yes. Without wavering. Confident in your heart that you are saved by the grace of God. And then He says, We're not to cast it away. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 35. Not to cast our confidence away. In verse 35, He says, Cast not away therefore your confidence. <coughs> which hath great re recompense of reward. Hey, how do you know you're saved? Because I'm confident in my heart that I'm saved by the grace of God. It's something that I'm going to hold unto the end of my earthly journey that I'm saved by the grace of God. What are you teaching, preacher, this morning? Are you trying to teach us eternal security? Sure I am. I can't think of anything better to teach than eternal security. We're to hold it fast. We're not to cast away our confidence that we are saved by the grace of God. You remember it was when Peter took his eyes off the Lord that he lost his confidence. And the reason we have so many with weak faith is because they simply took their eyes off the Lord and they don't have that full assurance by keeping their eyes on the Lord like those that keep their eyes on the Lord. Is your eye on Jesus today? Is your eye on Jesus today? You know, I read about Jonah. What an what a extraordinary man in the Word of God, Jonah. When you're first introduced to Jonah in the Word of God, you find that Jonah has already had a, a, a life-changing experience with God. I mean, when the very Jonah 1-1, one, one, the Bible tells us that he knows God. He knows God in the free pardon of sin. No doubt in my mind, he had the assurance of salvation in his heart and in his life. No doubt in my mind, he stood up and says, God! I'll serve you and go anywhere you want me to go. God said to him, Jonah, won't you go to him? <laughs> ah, no, no, sir. Brother God, uh, Jonah was standing before God. God said, go to Nineveh. Jonah said, no, sir, I'll not do it. And he walked out of the office of God in a huff. Mad as a horse. Sometimes God tells us things to do. And we get just as huffed up as Jonah. Don't be too critical on Jonah. Sometimes God tells us to be faithful and we get mad about it. Which preacher don't we get mad about? We walk out in the huff like John. God says, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh. Hey, it's been all right. God said, Jonah, go down to the Jews. Jonah says, Boy, I'll go down there. But God said, Jonah, go to Nineveh. The Ninevites were vicious, mean, cruel people. I read a little about the Ninevites, and they, they, they tell me that the Ninevites when they would capture a city or take a city, they'd take the first couple that they met and they abuse them and strip them of all their clothing and, and literally peel their hide from their body and let it string down from their body. We thought the Indians were the first ones to scalp, you know, and peel the flesh from human beings. But no, the Ninevites were. And then they'd take these two almost at the point of death. They were so tortured and miserable in their life condition, they'd march them through the streets of the city and make fun of them and laugh at them in their misery. They'd say the next hundred people that would approach them, they'd decapitate them, take their heads off their shoulder, and then line the gate into the uh, city there that they had captured with the heads of these that they'd taken from their shoulders. <coughs> Cruel, mean, 
vicious me. I don't blame Jonah. I don't blame Jonah for saying, no, Lord, I'm not going down there and walking out on God in the hut. I've seen some people, they say, preacher, would you go visit these people? I almost said, no. I mean, these people I have seen in my life, I just don't believe I'll do it. You, you have it too. You've talked to them. You know what I'm talking about. So, what did Jonah do? I said, in an extraordinary man. First thing Jonah did was went down to Tarshish. The Bible says he got a wood ship down there. And he paid the fare there. Let me tell you something, children. You listen carefully. Anytime you turn away from the will of God in your life, you're going to pay the fare there. Anytime God has a will for your life and you turn away from that will and do your own thing like you only did his own thing, you're going to pay the fare there. Jonah got aboard that ship. The Bible says it went out into the ocean. There came a great storm. Waters began to roll. The boat began to roll. And all those mariners on that ship fell down on their knees and began to pray. Isn't that sad? While the man of God went down into the ship and went to sleep. <laughs> Isn't that sad? When the uh, heathen of the world can pray to their God in vain. And the people of God that have a God that will answer their prayer and bless them go to sleep. Isn't that a shame? How long has it been since you prayed? How long has it been since you talked to God? Jonah finally, they came down, the captain did, and he said, hey boy, what's wrong here? Jonah told him what to do. He says, you throw me overboard. He said, I guarantee you, you'll both be saved. Jonah knew that being a, a backslidden Christian as he was, that it they just get him off that ship, the waters would become calm and everything would settle down and go back to normal. Sure enough, finally, after they tried everything within their power, they threw him overboard. And what happened? Just as soon as Jonah touched that water, my friend, the waters became calm and God had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And still, still, it was three days before Jonah prayed to God. In the belly of a whale, out of hell, he finally prayed to God. We'll take this story <laughs> a little further. And you imagine on that third day when he finally began to pray to God, all of his clothes were rotten off. He was smelling. He was thinking of the vomit of the acids of that old fish's belly and uh, rotten clothes on him. And God puked him, uh, had that uh, uh, fish to puke him up out on the shore. And you know what? When he got on dry land, God had not changed his mind yet. God says, Jonah, still won't you go to that. You see, when God tells you to do something, God has a will for your life. God doesn't change his mind. Amen. In three days, God hadn't, uh, Jonah hadn't spoke to God. And then when he prayed, God put him on dry land. But God hadn't changed his mind. He said, still, won't you go to Nineveh? Went on down there to Nineveh and preached and all of them repented and got right with God. Hey, someone said, well, when does a man do right? Is a man uh, doing right when he's preaching the Word of God? Is a man doing right when he's giving an invitation? Is a man doing right when souls are being saved? Is a man doing right when uh, 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 people are lying in the altar and born into the family of God? Is that when a preacher's doing right? Hey, you can do all of those things and still not do right. You said, what do you mean? Jonah sat down there after he had preached to them and they had repented. He got downright angry and mad. I mean, he got mad. Hot sun was blurring down on his head and he was just as mad as he could be because God had saved those people over there. And then out of the goodness and the love and the mercy of God's heart, God let a gourd vine come up. And let that gourd vine spread over the head of old Jonah. And when that gourd vine spread over the head of old Jonah, it saved his brain from being boiled or baked in the sun goodness of God and the love of God. Still old Joel sat there and his lips run out and mad as a wet setting hen because God had saved these people and Jonah said, I would that I could die. Hey, I'd be better off dead than seeing what God had done for these Gentile dogs. God says, all right, old boy. And God sent a little warning. <laughs> Not something spectacular. 
not something big, not something outstanding, not a whirlwind. But God sent a little worm. <coughs> that little worm just eat that sheep right off of Jonah's head. Left old Jonah sitting there with the sun on again. He told God, he said, now look here, Lord. He says, you, 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 you let this vine come up in one day and in one day you took it down. God says, yes, and I've got 120,000 little children that don't know their left hand from the right hand out there in the city of Nineveh. Jonah, is it right to let them perish? Jonah, is it right to let them die? God says, no. Let me ask you something this morning. Is it right for you and I this morning to have much of assurance in our heart? To let others perish and die when we know that we're on our way to heaven. When we know that we're on our way to heaven. Would it be just in our heart to let others die and not witness and not testify and not tell them about Jehovah and his plan of salvation? Would we be just? Could we ever be just? No. Brother, listen. You and I that have assurance of salvation this morning, there's one thing we ought to be. It's a witness for Jesus. Amen. I believe that with all of my heart. It's a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought to tell others. We ought to let others know what God hath done for us. We ought to keep our eyes upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Now let me show you something back there. I'll hurry. I've got about five minutes. I said I'd let you out, and I will let you out. Full assurance rest upon unassailable and unchanging Bible fact. God tells us that in John 6, 37. He says, All the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I'll no wise cast out. God says he'll not cast you out, he'll take you in. Then also in John 10, 27, 28, the Bible says that we are in his hand, and he gives unto us eternal life, and no man shall pluck us out of the Father's hand. The Father that gives by me is greater than them all. That's Bible facts. Amen. We're in the Father's hand. And then he says in Romans 8, 31, 39, nothing shall separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. That's God's Son. I'm telling about unassailed, unchanging Bible truth. God says He saved our every dying soul. We've got that assurance of salvation. And then another source of assurance is the completeness of the atoning work of the Lord Jesus Christ when He hung there upon that cross suspended between heaven and hell. And He says, It is finished. What was finished? Your redemption. Your salvation. To back that up a little further over in the book of Hebrews, I believe it's chapter 10, the Bible says, and when he hath purged us of our sins, he sat down on the right hand of the Father in glory. Yeah. Finished work. Sitting down means that he was resting from what he had accomplished on Calvary. Glory to God. That's assurance of the finished work of Jesus Christ. We have assurance because of that. And then further assurance spring from righteousness, not our own, but the Lord's. And I read it to you in the book of uh, Isaiah chapter 32 and verse 17. For we have righteousness that's of God. Not our own. Our own righteousness is filthy rags in the eyes of God. There's not one of us here this morning that's good. You might look in the mirror and you say you're handsome, good devil, you, but you are. You, you, may, you may be handsome and you may be a good devil, too. But there's not one of us that's good as far as within ourselves or within us. Not one. We've all seen and come short of the glory of God. And then there's the inner witness of the Spirit is certainly proof of our assurance. He says in 1 John 4, 13, Hereby know we that we dwell in Him, and He in us, because He hath given us of His, what? Spirit. Dwells within Him. Greater is He that is within than he that is, what? Without. Who's within? The Holy Spirit of God. What is it? He's the inner man. He witnesses to us constantly that we are saved. I don't have to have you around. I don't even have to have the Bible around. All I've got to have is Jesus in my heart and His Holy Spirit. And He tells me, you're saved. I guess, uh, I guess the saddest thing I read about the Vietnam War is those uh, uh, prisoners of war where they had taken their Bible away from them. 
taking the word of God. They, 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 you see, when they took the Bible away from them, they took all hope away from them. But yet there was some that had enough Bible knowledge and training as little children that they'd sit down and write verses of Scripture, and it's told me that one, that uh, they got together and wrote the whole entire book of Romans, those prisoners of war, from memory. And they would pass it out in little pieces of paper, and they would find comfort and consolation through that, you see. <coughs> I thought about myself. I said, boy, isn't that a blessing? Isn't that a wonderful blessing just to know that we've got the blessed Word of God and the Holy Spirit within our heart, and He just takes the Word of God and just drives it home to our heart day in and day out and says, you belong to Him. You're His. You're bought with a harvest. You belong to Jesus. That will be enough to make Presbyterians shout in here. Any Presbyterians in here this morning, hold your hand up your heart. Saved by the grace of God. Amen. We've got it in our heart. Then we have not only the indwelling of the Holy Spirit of God, but we have the fruits of the Spirit. <laughs> Some of us don't. We still have the fruits of the flesh. But the fruits of the Spirit is found over in the fifth chapter of the book of Galatians. And you can begin reading verse 22 down through verse 25, and it tells us what the fruit of the Spirit is. How many has that? You say, well, what is it? All right, let's see whether or not you qualify. All right, turn in your Bible right quick. First, uh, to the book of Galatians. <coughs> turn in your Bible, the book of Galatians, chapter 5. Let's begin reading there, verse 22. I want to see if you qualify. I want to see if you have the Spirit, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and the assurance of salvation. But the fruit of the Spirit is, number one, love. Do you love like you ought to love? Do you love your enemies like you ought to love your enemies? Do you love the brethren like you ought to love the brethren? Do you love the church like you ought to love the church? Most of all, do you love Jesus? Do you love the Lord? Love and then joy. <laughs> joy. Joy in time of sickness. Joy in time of adversities. Joy in time of sorrow. Joy in time of financial difficulties. I'll get down and ring that bell because that's where we all live. One time or another. Joy when people talk about you. Criticize you. Run you down. Joy. Joy when you have to go to your job. <laughs> this old job, I hate this old job. Joy. I'm trying to see if you qualify for blessing the sure. church. Peace. What is that? Peace. Faith produces peace. You got faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you got peace in your heart. Though the storms be raging, you've got peace in your heart. Long operating in church with the preacher home with the children work with the boss long stuff my father-in-law was one of the most long-suffering men I've ever known in all my life I knew him for 18 years before he went to be with the Lord It doesn't matter how much you rile, cuss, spit, fume, backfire, or anything else. He was just like he was when you started. I believe one thing that he couldn't comprehend. He couldn't comprehend, how come you want to put yourself through something like that? <laughs> I can't comprehend that. I really can't. I can't comprehend why we want to put ourselves through some of the things we put ourselves through some of the times. Can you? But if we just be a little long suffering, get back to normal. You get back to normal. Just 
be a little long suffering. Give it a little time. It'll get back to normal. Long suffering. We need it. Then he says, uh, are you qualified? <coughs> Gentleness. I'm not talking about putting the spur to your wife or to your husband, keeping them inside. I'm talking about being a little gentle, kind. I've got 300 ways back there to love your wife without ever making her mad. <laughs> On a piece of paper, right? 300 ways to love your wife without ever making her mad. I'm going to read that sometime. Goodness. Are you qualified? Come on now. Goodness. Faith. Meekness. Temperance. You know what temperance is? Come on, somebody. Hey, I'll close. Honest goodness. Five minutes I'm going to close. I'm going to quit. You know what temperance is? Come on, someone. Hold your hand up. I'm not trying to trick you or trap you or get you cornered. What is temperance? Self-control. Didn't say temper tantrum. <laughs> Didn't, Brother Frank. I felt so bad the other day. My wife said something to me. She says, I got chicken on the stove in there. I says, is it any good? <laughs> I've never known her to cook a bad piece. <laughs> But I just didn't I just didn't feel par like some of you all the time, you know. I says, is it any good? <laughs> she says, Well, why shouldn't it be? <laughs> I said, Well, I don't know. <laughs> all I had to do was say, Yes, honey, I'll go get this chicken, but it's good or bad, I'll give it. <laughs> You know, self-control. You know where I'm coming from. Come on now. You know where I'm coming from. I'm talking about having assurance of salvation. And one of the marks of it, the fruit of the Spirit, is self-control. Temperance. Yeah, I know we don't all get up on the right side of the bed. I know that everything don't go right in your home. Everything don't go right in the church. Everything don't go right on the job. But there's no use to take it out on the Lord and yourself. Some of the things, Brother Art, we put ourselves through, we don't have to do it. I, I look old, back over my life and be 61 years old. By the way, you people don't know that. <laughs> we ain't this month. I'll be 61 years old. And I look, I look back over my life and I see times that I put myself through temp temper tantrum. I'd been a whole lot better off just to control it. In the church and on the job and even in your home. Just to control it. I mean, one of the marks of blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine is self control. can't settle anything by arguing, fussing, fighting, and feuding. You can't settle anything that way. We, we've tried it in the past in wars of our country. I've seen it amongst churches, church members. You can't settle it. best way to settle anything is to be calm, cool, composed. I guarantee you can work out a solution. For you. Are you qualified? Against such, there is no law. Thank God. Well, lift off about eight or ten things because I said I'd let you out earlier and I will. Let's bow our heads, stand our feet. Whatever.